evening we're in we're going to be studying daniel 2 the prophetic portion now the whole book of daniel is prophetic even the stories are pro are prophetic however we are going to be looking particularly at the image tonight and with that in mind i want to start with a word of prayer and guess and ask god's holy spirit to be our teacher and our guide um as we, you know, as we delve into the word of God. So let's do that. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you for your grace and mercy. We want to thank you, Father, for not giving us what we deserve, but giving us what your dear son does. You see us, Father. There's nothing hid from your eyes. I'm not a better man than any person listening. And you are a God that loves each of us equally, Father. It is now our opportunity to eat, enter into fellowship with you through your word. So we ask, Lord, that you cover our accounts with your blood, with the blood of your dear son. We ask for the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is the only effectual teacher of truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I hope you guys came ready to think tonight because we're going we're gonna to think. And the views that I'm going to share with you as far as the screen is concerned is going to be a little different. I'm actually going to be sharing my a couple of Word documents with you. And so we're, we're interested in kind of investigating Scripture from that perspective. So you have your Bibles. Open them to Daniel 2. And we're just going to take our time and walk through a couple of passages. Daniel 2. And we're going to start reading at verse 31. Daniel 2 and verse 31. Daniel 2 and verse 31. The Bible says, Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broke into pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away and no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. So let's pause there for a moment. Now Daniel has gone into a position, because this is part two of a study that we started last week. Last week, I believe it was last week, Wednesday. Um, and so now we have this king who is actually receiving not just the interpretation, but the king is also receiving the vision itself. So in other words, the king had forgot his vision. God revealed the vision. And God now is revealing the interpretation. And if you back up just a little bit, God didn't just reveal to him the vision or the interpretation. He actually told the king what he was thinking about as he laid upon the bed, as he was thinking in his private chamber. And the reason why this becomes so important is because God is intimately concerned about his children. It is not just about knowing what event is about to take place. It is about knowing that God is intentional in his dealings with us on a personal level. Please get that because there are so many times that we are studying prophecy, want to know what's happening at the end of time. But really, God is dealing with our hearts when it comes to prophecy and trusting him with our salvation. So I want to make sure that point is clear. Now, as he's going through, he's identifying the dream. This is the dream. He's going through the dream. He's giving the um, the, the description, that's the word I was looking for. He's giving the description of the dream, but he's not giving the interpretation. And so what we're going to look for now is how 
Daniel interprets the dream. We are not looking for how we interpret the dream. We're looking for how Daniel interprets the dream first. But once we see how he interprets the dream, we might find what is most important in this interaction between Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel. All right, so let's look at the interpretation that is given by Daniel to the king. Now watch what it says. Verse 37. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven have given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. So you guys see that? So in this passage, we're, we find very simply, very easily, that God has given Nebuchadnezzar everything that he has. There's nothing that the king has that God himself did not allow for him to have. Now, when I say allow for, it doesn't mean that God um, made him be uh, wicked or evil. It means simply means that God allowed it. He allowed for him to be in power. He allowed for him to have this authority. He's, he's putting him in these positions because God has a plan. He's working everything after the counsel of his own will. And in fact, I forgot to answer or define what the counsel of God's will was from our last study, but we'll do it today. So keep this in mind. You, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, you are this head of gold. Now stay with me. Some of you guys are like, yo, Andre, this is basic. And mind you, the most profound truths come from the most basic and simple understandings. So we're going to build. I want you to stay with me as we build. I, I like to take my time and build a case so that when we, when we establish the truth, we can't be shaken from it, okay? So what I'm doing, what I'm literally doing with you guys as we're going through this study, we are building a foundation that's going so broad, so broad and so deep. So when it's broad and deep, when we build going up, unshakable, unshakable. So we're building broad and we're building deep and then we're going to build up because when we get to Daniel 11 or Daniel 12 or Daniel 7 and Daniel 9, you're going to have to have these foundations that we're laying here today. All right. So watch this. So you are the set of gold. Now watch the next part. And this is simple observation. OK. It says in verse number 38. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of heaven, hath he given into thine hand and have made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. So God is the one who has established this pagan king in position over his people. Stay with me. It says in verse number 39. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. And another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over how much of the earth? over all the earth. So again, my friends, we don't want to like overstep our bounds here. However, we're looking at how Daniel is interpreting the vision, not how we interpret it, not how we've heard it in an evangelistic series per se, but we're looking at how God himself is speaking through Daniel and how he's interpreting it. So let's go back again, verse 38, I mean, verse 39. And it says, and after thee shall arise another kingdom. So even though in verse 37 and verse 38, God established Nebuchadnezzar as the king, he's a king of a kingdom. And after Nebuchadnezzar, there will be another kingdom. Now, it is not my object to identify what that kingdom is. If you could look over my shoulder, it's actually right there behind my shoulder, but that's not our object, right? Another kingdom inferior to thee. Now, isn't that interesting? that the God of heaven would establish another kingdom that wasn't superior, that wasn't greater, but that was inferior to him. Watch this now. Pay attention. It says, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over what, my friends? All the earth. So tell me something. If this third kingdom comes on the scene and this third kingdom has rule over all the earth, would you consider that a world power? A world order? Yes. So this, these kingdoms that are in place have such influence that they have a, 
at least a third one, has a global impact. And this is why sometimes we have to be careful when we hear people say there's no such thing as a, a world order or things like that. You guys, let the Bible speak for itself. And I know we want to get away from conspiracy theories and things of that nature. I understand that. But the Bible says that the third kingdom is a world power. It is a world order. It rules over all the earth. Pay attention now. Notice what else it says. It says number verse 40. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. For as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and uh, brew. So I'm going to put up right now, um, and those of you who are listening on the podcast, I am putting up a document. It's a Word document. It's a simple document. And I'm going to share my screen. As soon as I figure out how to do that, give me a second here. I'm going to share my screen, and I'm going to share this document with you. All right, so you can see this document. And this document says visions, the visions, the vision with names and description. So here I have simplified. I have simplified what we read. So what we read was God telling Nebuchadnezzar, you are this head of gold, and Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon. And again, I'm using the text for the interpretation. And then we have it here where it says, chess and arms are of silver. That's another kingdom that's inferior to him. To him. That's the description that was given to the second kingdom. And then we have the third kingdom here. And that third kingdom, which is belly and thighs of brass, it says another third of brass, which bears rule over all the earth. Again, we're just using the text to give the understanding of what we are reading. OK, and then we have the fourth kingdom, which says it had legs of iron. It was as the fourth kingdom and it gave it a number. So notice the head of gold. You are the head of gold. It doesn't have a number, but we know it's the first one that's mentioned. Then it has chess and arms of silver, which is another kingdom inferior. And then we have a third kingdom, and that third kingdom is made of brass, and it bears rule over all the earth. And then we have a fourth kingdom, and that fourth kingdom has legs of iron, and it breaks in pieces all things. So for a moment, I just want you to observe and take it in, okay? Just observe and take it in. It gives a number to the third. It gives a number to the fourth. It does not give a number to the first or to the second. This becomes helpful when we're looking at Daniel chapter seven. OK, so this is how it's breaking down in Daniel two. You are the head of gold inferior. Now, I want you to observe with me. Observation. Gold is more valuable than silver. Silver is more valuable than brass. Brass is more valuable than iron. OK, there is a sequence. There is a, a, a degradation, if you will, in the value of the kingdoms that come after this first head of gold. Now, the reason for that is, my friends, is very simple. It is not by the might of these kingdoms that they are conquering the previous kingdom. In fact, because we are studying and I'm not in a rush, I'm not preaching, I'm just walking it through with you. I want you to go with me to one of the most powerful Proverbs that I have ever read in relation to Bible prophecy. Go to Proverbs chapter 14, Proverbs chapter 14, and I want us to read verse number 34, Proverbs chapter 14, or Proverbs chapter 14, and we're looking at verse 34. Notice what the Bible says. Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. What do you mean? Righteousness lifts up nations. Sin brings down nations. Righteousness makes God's, makes uh, nations rise and come to the top. But sin brings nations down. Now, the reason why we're going through this, what nation does Babylon end up taking over? I mean, when we read it in Daniel chapter one, who does Babylon take captive? 
well, that's the kingdom of Judah. Why does why does uh, Babylon take Judah captive? Babylon takes Judah captive because Judah has broken their covenant relationship with God. So in God's eyes, Babylon is fulfilling his will more than God's own people. Let me show you something. Let me take you to the book of the book of I want to say Jeremiah. Isaiah, Jeremiah. Jeremiah. And I want to read Jeremiah Oh, that's a nice one, too. Chapter 25. Jeremiah chapter 25. And I want us to read verse 20, verse 3, okay? And again, we're studying. We're not in a rush. We're all we're doing. We're looking for what does the Bible say? Remember, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. So Jeremiah 25 and we're going to start reading at verse verse number three. The Bible says, from the 13th year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, even unto this day, that is the three and 20th year, the word of the Lord have come unto me and I have spoken unto you, rising early and speaking, but ye have not hearkened. So now, God is trying to speak. He's trying to give warning to his people, but they are hard headed. I wonder, are we hard headed too? I mean, obviously we are. There's no question that we are hard headed as well. And it says, and the Lord has sent unto you all his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them. But ye have not hearkened nor inclined your ear to hear. So when it says rising early, it's not just talking about rising early in the morning. It's saying before I have sent these judgments, I've sent prophets way in advance to give you warning about what is about to transpire. And my friends, God is the same today. Surely the Lord God will do nothing unless he reveals his secrets unto his servants, his servants, the prophets. Notice, going a little bit further, it says, verse 5, they said, turn ye again now everyone from his evil way and from the evil of your doings. And dwell in the land that the Lord have given unto you and to your fathers forever and ever. And go not after other gods to serve them and to worship them and to provoke and provoke me not to anger with the works of your hands. And I will do you no hurt. Again, God is pleading, right? He's saying, look, don't build up idols. Don't whatever you do, do to the honor and glory of God. He's he's imploring his people to follow him. But watch what happens. Verse seven, yet ye have not hearkened unto me, saith the Lord, that ye might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to your own work. Keep that phrase in mind. The works of your hands, the works of your hands to your own hurt. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of hosts or Lord of hosts, because ye have not heard my words. Watch this now. Behold. I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord. And Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. Now, did you guys see? Did you get that? Notice how God has classified Nebuchadnezzar as his servant while he's rebuking his own chosen people. Did you get that? Notice that because when we're looking at the rise and fall of nations, they rise and fall based on their relationship to the most high. And it is clear that God is the one that gave Nebuchadnezzar his authority to take his own, to take his chosen people into captivity. Are you following? So when we see you are this head of gold. Nebuchadnezzar is fulfilling a purpose that God has designed, and Nebuchadnezzar, in that condition, is a willing conduit for God to work. In fact, you can read later in the book of Jeremiah, Nebuchadnezzar sent a a soldier, a general by the name of Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar, I believe, is on the second or third wave 
into Jerusalem to, to, to take Israel captive, had captured uh, Israel and had freed Jeremiah the prophet from his own people, ca- you know, capturing him. And Nebuzaradan turns to Jeremiah, and I'll never forget reading this, and it just blew my mind. And Nebuzaradan, who is a pagan general, turns to Jeremiah the prophet and says, the reason why <laughs> you guys were taken captive is because you have disobeyed your God. When I read that, my mind was blown. I'm saying, what? You're telling me that God has a chosen people and his chosen people have decided that they don't want to follow righteousness, but this pagan king is being more righteous by following the light that he has. Now, my friends, I'm going to make an application. There are many of us that are concerned about the outside movements of what's happening in the world, and we are not ready ourselves to be true examples to the world of what a Christian is supposed to be. So we're ready to preach about what is about to transpire with this prophecy and that prophecy, not understanding that it is a a judgment on us first, my friends. I'm not afraid of what's going on out there. In fact, my friends, there are many who are outside of Christianity that are following all the light they have. There are many outside of my own church that are following all the light that they have, and they're in close relationship with God. While those of us who have a knowledge of God and a knowledge of present truth really don't have it in our hearts. And that's a sad statement. But I'm not making the statement up. It's not something I've created off the top of my head. The reality is, my friends, that the history that we find with Israel is repeated in the experience of those who are living in the last hours of first history. So in Daniel 2, Daniel uh, speaks to Nebuchadnezzar, you are this head of gold. That means Nebuchadnezzar at that time is following God's will. But watch this. Jeremiah 25 Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, say of the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, it says, and will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof and against all these nations round about and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment and an hissing and perpetual desolations. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones and the light of the candle. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. So again, God is talking. He's letting them know how long their judgment is supposed to be. It's supposed to be for 70 years. Now watch at the end of this time. Watch what happens. Verse 12, and it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord. Why? Why will the God of heaven punish Babylon for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans and will make it perpetual desolation? So did you see the text? So first, God uses the king of Babylon, his servant, because The king of Babylon is following instruction. He's doing what God wants him to do. We know the story of Nebuchadnezzar. Ultimately, in chapter four of Daniel, he's converted, right? Chapter four, he's converted. But after him, chapter five, chapter six, these persons that come up, uh, not converted. Okay, chapter five, not converted. His grandson, not converted. And so that king, God now sends judgment and now Babylon falls because of its sins, according to Jeremiah. Now watch this. The next kingdom that comes up after Babylon is an inferior kingdom, the Bible says. But I want to show you something else with this one. Go with me to the book of Daniel, Daniel 5. And again, this is just for we're touching it. I'm not digging into it yet. Look at Daniel 5. And it's okay. We're studying. It's okay to study. In Daniel 5, this is when the handwriting's on the wall, and I don't want to get to all those details yet, but I want you to see this. The king, king, the king cannot interpret the vision. He can't interpret the dream, so he's, he's a little flustered with the handwriting, right? So he brings in his wise men, and without going into great detail, I want to read a passage that's actually quite telling. 
And this is this is Daniel speaking directly to Belshazzar. Here it is. Verse 18, verse 17, verse 17. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, and this is dealing with Nebuchadnezzar's grandson as Babylon's about to fall. Let thy gifts be to thyself and thy rewards to another, yet I will read the writing unto the king and make known to him the interpretation. O thou king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. Watch this. And for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would, wh whom he, would he slew, and whom he would he kept alive. And whom he would he set up, and whom he would he put down. Watch now. But when his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him. And he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like the beast, and his dwelling was with wild asses, and they fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men, and that he appointeth over it whomsoever he will. Watch this now. And thou, his son, Belshazzar, has not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this. So what is, what is Daniel doing? Daniel is recounting to this young man the history of his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, and he said, you knew the history of your father, and you did not follow after righteousness. So what happens? Watch this. It says, but has lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before thee. And thou and thy lords, thy wives, and thy concubines have drunk wine in them. And thou hast praised the gods of silver and of gold, of brass, of iron, and wood and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know. And the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose all, whose are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified. Then was the part of the hand sent from him, and this writing was written. Now, the writing written simply stated, your kingdom is departed. Many, many tuck of your farson. You have been weighed in the balances. Your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. That very night, my friends, that happened. Now, why am I reading that? Because that night, Darius comes in and takes the kingdom when this young man who knew the history of his father refused to follow righteousness. Now, I want you to think about this. Again, we're studying prophecy, but we're really studying our lives here. This young man did not have the long lifespan of his grandfather and have the opportunities, uh, the length of time that his grandfather had. This young man should have learned the lessons before. Therefore, his time to make a decision was shorter. And I say to you, my friends, we're living in a similar time. You see, the history of our country is, is being presented to us even now as the great Virus is in our land and, and greater trials are ahead of us. But we are not learning our lesson. And because we're not learning our lesson, we are about to enter into a crisis. My friends, that unless you have a supernatural connection with the Most High, you're not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. So it is imperative that we learn from the lessons of our forefathers. Our forefathers, our moms and our dads, our grandparents and those who went before us. We can't say, well, it's I'm just going to live my life and I'm just going to do what I do I'm just, and and ignore the lessons, my friends. You see, in my family, I never you know, for me personally, I never smoked anything, never drank anything. And I learned the lesson not to do that a long time before. You know, my dad told me stories about his life. I looked at the lives of others who were doing those things. I can guarantee you, my friends, if I ever took a swig of anything, I'm, I'm quite sure I'd be a drunkard of some sort. I'm quite sure my, my functional ability would be way down because I should have learned the lessons of those before that have gone beforehand. And my friends, there's still time for us to repent. You know, if we've done things that we shouldn't have done, God still has given us time. But we need to learn these lessons now before it is forever too late. And like this young man, he didn't learn the lesson. But watch this. Remember, righteousness exalts a nation. But sin is a reproach to any people. Sin is what brings nations families, and organizations down. So we must be aware of this sin issue. Sin is the problem. In fact, I found it interesting. You know, as I'm studying prophecy, 
The hinge of Bible prophecy rests on the covenant relationship with the Most High. The hinge of it, like prophecy literally is based on the covenant relationship with the Most High. As one violates the covenant with the Most High, there is a downfall that comes in the experience of the believer, whether it's in body, mind, or soul, finance, or whatever. So we must make sure that we are in close covenant relationship with him as we're walking with him in these final hours of earth's history. But well, watch this. Now, in chapter 6, there's a man named Darius. In chapter 6, Darius is the uncle of Cyrus. Cyrus is the great king that is to come into Israel and capture Israel. Um, I'm sorry, capture Babylon. And God actually put Daniel in position so that he could influence these great men of the earth. I want you to go with me to the book of, I want to say Isaiah. I want to say Isaiah. And it's interesting because when you look at when you look at Bible prophecy and God's putting folks in position, you know, initially, when you think about it, when Daniel's taken into Babylon and he's a slave, he's not thinking he's going to influence the great king of Babylon. Right. And when God puts us in certain circumstances and it looks like, you know what, this is not what I want in my life. God is probably setting us up to have an influence in a way that we didn't think would be possible. But I, I want you to read with me in the book of Isaiah. We're going to chapter 44. I want you to see this. Isaiah chapter 44. And again, we're looking at this idea. Righteousness exalts a nation. So Nebuchadnezzar, you are this head of gold. And Nebuchadnezzar, as he's walking after God's way, his kingdom is exalted. But when we follow, when we don't follow God's way, watch, there's another kingdom that's risen up. Watch this. We're in Isaiah chapter 44, and we're looking at verse number 28, okay? We'll start at verse 28. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 44, verse 28. The Bible says, that saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built and to the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. Well, that's interesting. In this passage, God is identifying Cyrus as his shepherd. So please note, Cyrus is the king of Medo-Persia. It is the second kingdom that comes after Babylon. And Cyrus is called his shepherd. Nebuchadnezzar was called God's servant. Are you following? Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Cyrus is the king of Medo-Persia. Hope you're following. Righteousness exalts a nation. So Cyrus is following God's divine providence. Chapter 45, verse 1. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus. So the Lord has called Cyrus his shepherd, now the Lord is calling Cyrus his anointed, whose right hand I have held to subdue nations before him. And I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two leaved gates and the gates shall not be shut. You guys see that? There's even the, that prophecy there that tells you how Cyrus and Darius diverted the water, went in be, below the gates into the city and captured the city that very night. God is being specific in how that would take place. But I, I just I know, you know, some of this stuff already, but I want to highlight the most important part. God used a pagan king to do his will when the other preceding kingdom fell out of righteousness. Each kingdom has a time and an opportunity to reflect God and fulfill God's purpose. Now, I want to read something to you. Hopefully, I can find it. I'm going to see if I can find it. It came to my mind as I'm, I'm teaching here. So, remember I read to you uh, the other day from a book called Education, and I want to read this part because I think this is so pertinent. Here it is. Uh, it's from the book Education, page 125. Uh, the principle is sound. Watch this. 
It says, in the word of God, only is this clearly set forth. Here it is shown that the strength of nations as of individuals is not found in the opportunities or facilities that appear to make them invincible. Now, again, we, we proved that already because we looked at it and we said, well, gold is more precious than silver. Silver is more precious than brass. Brass is more precious than iron. So we know the value of the kingdoms. And we already saw the scripture said this kingdom shall be inferior. So these kingdoms that are being set up are not set up because they have great prowess. They're being set up because there is a purpose. Watch this. I'll read this again. Here it is shown that the strength of nations as of individuals is not found in the opportunities or facilities that appear to make them invincible. It is not found in their boasted greatness. It is measured by the fidelity with which they fulfill God's purpose. Did you get that? Each nation has a purpose. The United States of America has a purpose. What's going to end up happening very soon, my friends, because our country is forgetting what its purpose is, it's going to be in a situation where God's people are going to be in trouble, okay? And it's okay. I'm not afraid of the trouble. You know what I am afraid of? I'm afraid of myself. I don't know. Some people are afraid of, a, of a, a, the Antichrist power. Some people are afraid of the government. Some people are afraid of secret societies. I'm afraid of myself. You know, you know myself is the greatest enemy. Did you deal with yourself today? Have you seen yourself today? I mean, in, in its realness, you know, only in a, in a vision of Christ can a true knowledge of self be obtained. Self is the greatest enemy. So I'm not afraid of the end times. I'm afraid of myself because self doesn't like to be subdued. And this is the issue with these nations. These nations are interested in having power and authority and but this power and authority comes from one that is orchestrating everything after the counsel of his own will. At the, and at the end of the day, I, let me read something else to you. I, and again, this is my last reading uh, for the moment. Watch this. man. This is just. In the annals of human history. The growth of nations, the rise and fall of empires appear as dependent on the will and prowess of men. So their intelligence, their greatness, right? That's why they're in power. They have the greatest you know, organization for their politics. That's why they're in power. No, my friends, God has a purpose and an intent with folks that are in power. And it doesn't mean that those folks in power are righteous. It means that they must fulfill their purpose while they're in power. And if you're not fulfilling your purpose, I care not what position you have, whether it be father or mother, whether it be president or vice president, whether it be pastor or or deacon if you're not fulfilling your purpose my friend then god is going to have to move you aside so that his purpose will be done are you hearing what i'm saying in the annals of human history the growth of nations the rise and fall of empires appear as dependent on the will and prowess of man the shaping of events seems to a great degree to be determined by his power ambition or or caprice but in the word of God, the curtain is drawn aside and we behold behind, above and through all the play and counterplay of human interests and power and passions, the agencies of the all merciful one silently, patiently working out the counsels of his own will. Mercy. So God is the one in control. He's the one that sets up Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is following after God's instruction or his purpose, fulfilling his purpose through Nebuchadnezzar. God raises up Cyrus to fulfill his purpose when, when Babylon is not fulfilling his purpose. And the same thing happens for the next kingdom that has control over the world. That kingdom is raised up to fulfill a purpose. There's an intent. God has a plan. God has a plan. It's not some dude's idea. It's not somebody in the, in the secret room organizing. No, God is the one in control. He has this on lockdown. Now pay attention. The reason why this becomes important, my friends, because when, when we are, when we, let me say it in a, in a different way. 
you know, sometimes like right now, there's this coronavirus and there's going to be an amplification of anxiety as everyone watches the news every day to hear what man says about something they don't really have a complete control over. They are focusing on man's words as they're locked in their houses, watching the television and constantly watching these things. And if they're not watching that, then we're dumbing down our minds, doing other things so that we don't have to think about it. But either way it goes, the devil's winning on this one. He's winning because what God's children should be doing while we have this opportunity of what we call our individual silos where we, we have to be locked down. What would it be like if God's people during this time said, you know what? I need to get on my word like I've never gotten in my word before. What if we, what if we were like, I need to study like I've never studied before in my life. I need to pray like I've never prayed before in my life. I need to reach out to my friends and family who I know are home now that would normally not be home. My friends, we are reacting instead of being proactive. And the devil has us on lockdown. We should be proactive getting God's message out to the people. But again, the reason why we are doing this is because we don't understand God has a plan, that God has all things in control, that there's nothing hid from his eyes, that he's executing a plan that these people don't fully understand. God raises up kings and he sits them down. He's the one that's in control of the situation. But again, paying attention, because ultimately, if you go back to Daniel 2, go back to Daniel 2 for a second. Go back to Daniel 2. Watch this. Now, in Daniel 2, as we're walking through, because Daniel literally, he doesn't know about Medo-Persia as far as the next kingdom to rise up. All he knows is that there's this, this element, and, this, and God told him that this kingdom is going to be superior to the next, and then this one's going to be superior to We know the names because we can look back at history. But the purpose of prophecy is not simply so we can be like, oh, that's what happened in the past. The principles that we see there, we're supposed to apply to our everyday life. Now watch. So as he's going through and he's explaining, go back to Daniel 2, and I'm looking at verse number verse number 3, verse, 30, verse 39, sorry, at verse 39. It says, and after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another kingdom of brass which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces, and so do of all things, and as iron that breaketh all things, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, parts of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, and there shall be in it of the strength of iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, and as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Pause. Think. We're thinking. We're pausing. There are two elements introduced here. Iron and clay. Iron and clay. Now, first of all, we already know that the Babylon's head of gold, chest and arms of silver. We're, we're, I'm putting out there is Medo Persia. You don't have to believe that right now. It's not, you don't have to believe that right now. I'm going to prove that in another study. But Medo Persia is the next one. Next to that is another kingdom that comes up. And then this fourth kingdom, no names. So I'm not even going to give it a name. What we're going to do, we're just simply going to use the Bible to describe the principle of what's transpiring with the iron and the clay. Okay? We're going to use the Bible to de describe it. So we know that all these other kingdoms have been been uh, civil kingdoms or nations. But this clay is interesting because it's a mixture of iron and clay. So with that in mind, with that in mind, I want you, I want you to do something for me. I want you to look at a couple of Bible verses, iron and clay together. And I want you to look at a couple of Bible verses and then we're gonna draw a conclusion after we look at the verses. All right. So I want you to open your Bibles with me. And again, I want you to be thinking people. OK, we're not just following what I'm saying. We're looking at the Bible. So Jeremiah, I want you to go to Jeremiah chapter 18. Jeremiah chapter 18. And we're first going to find this in the Old Testament. 
And then we're going to find the principle applied in the New Testament. So Jeremiah chapter 18, and we're looking at verses 4 through 6. Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 4 through 6. Watch carefully. Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 4 through 6. The Bible says, And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter? So the Lord, saith the Lord, behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. So what do we have? We have God saying, a potter has clay. God says, he is the potter and his house of Israel, you are the clay. So the clay in this sense is God's people. Are you following? Stay with me. Isaiah chapter 64, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Isaiah chapter 64. We're looking now at verse number eight. And we're studying and it's okay to study. Amen. Isaiah 64. And we're looking at verse eight. The Bible says, but now, O Lord, thou art our father. We are the clay. Thou and thou are potter and we all are the work of thy hand. You guys see it? So again, God is the potter. The Lord is the potter. We are the clay. The church is the clay. The people are the clay. His people are the clay. Keep it in mind. God is the potter and we are the clay. Isaiah chapter 45. Isaiah chapter 45. And we're looking at verses 9 through 11. Watch this. Isaiah 45. We're looking at verses 9 through 11. Pay attention. Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. Let the pot shirt strive with the pot shirts of the earth. Shall the clay say unto him that fashioned it, What makest thou? Or thy work? He hath no hands. Woe unto him that saith unto his father, What begettest thou? Or to the woman, What hast thou brought forth? Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and his maker. Ask me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands command ye me. The work of my hands, talking about his people. God is the maker. We are the clay. One more verse on this point. One more passage, not one more verse, one more passage. The book of Romans. Watch how Romans applies it. And Romans applies it not simply to Israel, but to his church, God's people. Romans takes the same passage from Isaiah, puts it into the New Testament. And I have Romans chapter 9, we're looking at verses 19 through 26. Watch what the Bible says. Thou wilt say then unto me, why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that replies against God? Shall a thing formed say to him that formed it? Why hast thou made me thus? Have not the potter power over the clay? Of the same lump to make one vessel into honor and to another dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with such long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he have afore prepared unto glory? Even so, whom he have called not of the Jews only, pay attention, but also of who, my friends? The Gentiles. So in the Old Testament, it sounds like, oh, he's just talking about the Jews. But now Romans is saying, no, I'm not just talking about the Jews as being my clay or the one speaking to me in rebellion. I'm speaking about my people, Jew and Gentile. As he said also, as he says also in Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people and her beloved, which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, 
There shall they be called the children of the living God. Pause. So what do we have? We have an image. And at the feet of the image is iron and clay. We know that iron is a state power because it's from right after the kingdom of, of the brass kingdom. So that iron goes into the feet. And now we have a church power. We have a state power and a church power. Keep that in mind as we're reading, because my friends, many have forgotten these principles and now are, are doing things in our present world that will lead to destruction. OK, stay with me. So we have a state power and we have a church power, statecraft, churchcraft, iron, clay. Go back to Daniel. Daniel 2. Go back to Daniel 2. Watch. Watch carefully. Watch carefully. So what do we have here? Again, I'm not naming names. Not yet, but I will name names. I'm not afraid to name names, but it's imperative that we learn how to study. OK, so in Daniel 2. It says all the way down here at verse number 40. OK, Daniel 2, verse 40. Watch what the Bible says. Daniel 2, verse 40. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. For as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things. And as the iron that breaketh all, the, all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. So iron is known for strength. Watch this. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. And there shall be in it of the strength of iron, or as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken or partly weak. That's the, the actual word. Instead of broken is the word weak, partly strong and partly weak. All right. I have a raised hand. Um, so that raised hand, Lewis, uh, I don't know, brother or sister Lewis, if you could hold your question, I will actually answer questions at the end. And you can actually type your question in the question and answer um, component, and I will seek to answer your question that way. So go ahead and type your question in the question and answer section, and I will seek to answer your question that way. All right. So watch this, my friends. So we have here iron and clay. One is partly strong and the other is partly weak. Verse 43. Watch carefully. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. So I want to deal with this idea of cleaving, and then I'll go back to the idea of the seed of men. So I want to go back to that phrase cleave. Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. The first time that word is used. Genesis chapter 2. And we're looking at verse number, let's start at verse number 21, just for context sake. Genesis chapter 2, and we're looking at verse 21 for context sake. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Watch carefully. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of, what's it say? Taken out of man. Watch this. And therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be, what's it say? One flesh. Now for a moment because there are some assumptions that folks have made that 
that cause some issues in regards to interpreting prophecy. When you are married, as far as husband and wife, doesn't mean that you're one. I don't know if you've ever thought about this. Like you could be married and not be one. Did you, you know that, right? You can be married and not be one. You can be married and not cleave. The idea of cleaving is this, this, this fu almost like a fusion, if you will, of two parties into a oneness together. And so there can be people that try to fit and be one. And for a time, they look like they're one, but they're not one. And you know why they can't be one? Because this idea of unity and oneness comes from the one that is actually one. <laughs> I don't know if that makes any sense to you, but there are, there are three that bear witness in heaven. And those persons, the Godhead functions as one unit. In John 17, the Bible talks about oneness and that oneness being a sign. Man, I wasn't even thinking about talking about this. But that oneness being a sign that God is with his people and we are with him. So there could be no complete cleaving one to another if Christ is not the center of that cleaving. So it doesn't mean that people don't look like they're one because people go to church all the time. They sit in the front row and they raise hands, they, they shout hallelujah, but they're not one. They sleep in the same bed, but they're not one. They sing songs of, to Jesus, but they're not one because oneness is a supernatural work that God himself must do in the hearts of his children. And Jesus prayer right now, as he's in the heavenly places above is for oneness amongst his children. And friends, we're not one. We're not one. You know, if we were one, if we were one, my friends, the church members that you haven't spoken to all week, you'd be trying to figure out where they are. I think we're getting a little too comfortable with this uh, this uh, separation thing, you know, like everybody's chilling and hanging out and doing their own thing on, on you know, not, not going to church. Man, if you're one, you don't just let people disappear. You, just let, you don't just let people hurt. You see... In the last days, what's being personified here or demonstrated here when iron and clay are seeking to mix together, when the church and state are seeking to unite, there can be no marriage between the two parties. It's not going to work. And what we should be telling every church leader in every denomination, stop with this business of trying to organize the world via the governments of this world. It's not going to work. In fact, let me read something to you. And I'm telling you this not because I'm hateful or angry. It's because I'm letting you know what prophecy itself says. Watch what the Bible says. Revelation chapter chapter 17. I mean, you can read this from different places, but 17 says it in a particular way that I find to be very, very interesting. In Revelation chapter 17, it's talking about the end times and there's all this imagery there. And when we continue to study together, we'll break this down line by line, just like we're doing in Daniel. But right now, I want you to see something. Watch this. John, Revelation chapter 17, and there's this like this little riddle that's here, and I love the riddle. It's actually fun once you understand it. There's a riddle, and I'm going to read the riddle, but I'm going to get to the main point. The riddle starts out in verse 9. It says, and here is, and here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven hairs are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth, and there are seven kings. Five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Watch carefully. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. Watch this carefully, my friends. This is the part I want you to see. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour. How long? One hour. It's not talking about a literal hour. It's talking about a space of time. Okay. With the beast. Watch verse 13. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. So these kings have one mind to give the strength and power to the beast. And watch, when they do this, when they seek to make a union, watch what happens. These shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and king of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he said unto me, the waters which thou sawest where the horse sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore 
and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Pause. Why did I share that with you? They have one mind. For a time, they look like they're united. For a time, they're coming together to stamp out God's chosen people. For a time, it looks like they are one, just like the iron and the clay in the feet. It doesn't say the feet are broken. It says they look like they're one. But at the end of the day, they turn on each other. They burn the whore. And I'm telling all the churches, I care not which church, stop playing with the politics of this world. Stop trying to have power and influence the world by the political systems that are there. Your power comes from above, comes from the most high, comes from the proclamation of the gospel that we find in Jesus Christ the righteous. And the Bible tells us they're still going to do it. Like no matter what I say, they're still going to do it. It's just a call to those that are par participating. Stop doing it. Stop, stop identifying yourself as a Republican or as a Democrat. Stop identifying yourself with these parties. There is a kingdom party that you need to be a part of. And in that kingdom that is being set up, there is, there is an eternal kingdom. In fact, Man, it's already been an hour. I can't believe it. It's an hour's gone by. In fact, I want to read something to you. I wanted to get to a certain place, but I'm going to have to pause with that and address it the next time we study prophecy on Wednesday. But uh, let me show you something. Go back to Daniel 2. Go back to Daniel 2 for a moment. Watch this. Watch Daniel 2. In Daniel 2, you'll notice something. Look at this. So after this iron and clay business goes on, there's a union of, there's this desire for church and state to be connected. Verse 44 says this. And in the days of these kings, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. Watch. Which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. But it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand, the Bible says, forever. So these persons that are seeking to use the church and the state as one to, to control the masses, these persons are going to try to do this. And as they're doing this, the God of heaven is going to say, enough is enough. I'm setting up my kingdom. Now I'm going to show you something. And over the next 15 minutes... If you're still with me, you're, you're going to have a special bonus right now. There is something interesting about this prophecy that I think people have just overlooked and made assumptions about. But I'm going to go back and I'm going to challenge you with some, some passages of Scripture that I want you to look at, okay? God sets an eternal kingdom. But what takes place in order for this to transpire? Go back to Daniel 2, again, looking particularly at verse number 34, watch. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands. Now, my friends, we need to do a deep dive into this idea of without hands. What does that mean? Stone cut out without hands? And there are some that will make an assumption, like, so, for instance, I, let me just read it, read it further here so you can see what I'm talking about. It says, cut out without hands, it smite, and it smites the image at the feet, right? And then it says, everything becomes like chaff. And then it says, verse 35, and no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now, that's rich brothers and sisters. Okay. We're going to take our time on this point because I want you to, I want you to think about it. This rock is cut out without hands. What does it mean to be without hands? Go with me to the book of Mark, the book of Mark, the gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 14, Mark chapter 14. And we're looking at verse 58. Mark 14, and we're looking at verse 58. 
Watch carefully, my friends. The Bible says, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands. And within three days, I will build another made, what's it say? Without hands. Well, that's interesting. So they're going to destroy a temple that's made with hands. What are you talking about? They're talking about the physical structure of a building. Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. So they're saying, oh, he said, they're going to destroy this temple that's made with hands. Jesus is saying, I'm going to, and then Jesus is saying, I'm going to build a temple made without hands. What is that? Go to Colossians. Colossians. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Watch. I hope you're studying with me, my friends. Colossians chapter 2. And we're looking at verse 11. Colossians 2 and verse 11. The Bible says, In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Interesting. In putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by circumcision of Christ. What are we talking about right here? So here Colossians is referencing the Jewish uh, tradition with Abraham and they cut off the foreskin of the private area uh, as a sign of their covenant relationship. Right. But Colossians is saying that there is a there's a circumcision that's done without hands. What is that? There's a spiritual circumcision. There's a spiritual interaction. So the body, the temple that is raised up without hands is a spiritual temple. In other words, it's divine intervention. Divine intervention. Now, this becomes so powerful, my friends. Remember, the rock is cut out without hands, meaning this is no man's dealings. This is a supernatural intervention. It's cut out supernaturally without hands and it's coming and it's going to strike the image at the feet, not in the head, not in the chest, not in the hips, not in the legs. It's going to strike the image at the feet. So there's a time frame for the striking of the image, right? Stay with me on this. So the rock is cut out without hands from a mountain. Now, what is a mountain? Okay, it's easy to see. A mountain in Daniel 2. Go back to Daniel 2. Go back to Daniel 2. Right there in the text. I don't have to add anything to it. Notice verse 44. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. Just in case you, you missed that, the rock strikes the image and grows into a great mountain. That mountain becomes a kingdom. Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 51. Just so you can see it in a different place. Jeremiah 51. Beginning at verse 24, Jeremiah 51, beginning at verse 24, the Bible says, I will render unto Babylon and to all the inhabitants of Chaldea all their evil that they have done in Zion in your sight, saith the Lord. So who's the Lord talking about? He's talking about Babylon. Okay, watch verse 25. Behold, I am against thee, O destroying mountain, saith the Lord, which destroyeth all the earth, and I will stretch out my hand upon thee and roll thee down from the rocks and will make thee a burnt mountain. So in this context, the mountain in Jeremiah 51 is the kingdom of Babylon. So mountains are simply kingdoms, okay? So the rock strikes the image at the feet and then the rock grows into a mountain. Don't miss it, my friends. I don't want you to miss it. I want you to get this. You stay with me on this. The rock strikes the image and grows into a rock mountain. Now the rock is cut out of another mountain. That's what it says. The rock in Daniel 2 is cut out of another mountain. What is that mountain? Well, the elements of this rock come from the elements of that mountain. And that mountain is the kingdom of God in heaven. Stay with me. You say, Andre, you got to prove that. I don't have to prove that right now. But that elements, the elements of that rock are cut from that mountain, and that rock strikes the image at the feet. Now, Brothers and sisters, there's a lot that I want to say in regards to this. However, I want to take you to a place in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah, the 11th chapter. 
Jeremiah, Isaiah, Jeremiah. Okay. Isaiah, the 11th chapter. Sometimes I got to say the books of the Bible in my head so I know which way I'm going. <laughs> so Isaiah, the 11th chapter. Watch this. And we're reading, reading carefully here. The first part of the passage is talking about Jesus Christ as the, the anointed one, as the Messiah, right? We're going to go down to verse number seven. No, the, the verse number, yeah, let's start at verse number five. And again, we're, we're kind of in the middle of a, of a, a passage here, so it's, the whole context won't be gotten. But verse five says, and, and righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins. And faithfulness, the girdle of his reins. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the lion and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf, and the young lion, and the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them, and the cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. So tell me. Does this sound like heaven? Yeah, of course. This is peaceful. Animals that normally don't get along are getting along. Kids are playing with lions and adders and asp and cockatrices and dens. And, you know, that's that sounds like heaven to me. Verse nine. Then I'm sorry. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. Interesting. For the earth. Why? Why will I not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain? Why? For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Okay, did you get that? I want you to think. Stay with me. Daniel 2, a rock cut, of a, cut out of a mountain without hands. Without hands means that it's a supernatural intervention. There's su something supernatural taking place. It's cut out of a mountain. A mountain. That's God's kingdom. The elements of that kingdom are now being established here on planet Earth because it strikes the image at the feet and grows into a great mountain and it fills the entirety of the earth. What is it that's filling the whole earth? Based on Isaiah chapter 11, it is the full knowledge of the Lord. It is the knowledge of God that's filling the whole earth. Now, my brain just went to two other places, but let's. Hold your hand here in Isaiah 11. I'm, right now, I'm emphasizing this idea of the filling of the earth. Go to Revelation chapter 18, okay? Revelation chapter 18. Look at what the Bible says. Revelation chapter 18, and we're looking at verse number one. The Bible says, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. So what am I doing? I'm juxtaposing texts together. So I'm saying in Revelation chapter 18, the earth is lightened with the Lord's, with the Lord's glory. In the, as Isaiah chapter 11, it says the knowledge of the Lord has filled the whole earth. That's why everybody's at peace. In Daniel chapter 2, the rock strikes the image at the feet and grows into a great mountain and fills the whole earth. Are you following? So that's Daniel 2, Isaiah chapter 11. That's Revelation chapter 18. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah chapter 60. Look what the Bible says, Isaiah 60 in verse number one. The Bible says, arise, shine, for the light has come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness to people, but the Lord shall rise upon thee. So now that's interesting. And his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light and the kings to the brightness of thy rising. So now watch, watch the rock. Cut out of a mountain without hand, strikes the image at the feet. The, the rock grows into a great mountain and fills the whole earth. The knowledge of the Lord fills the whole earth, Isaiah chapter 11. The glory of God fills the whole earth, Revelation chapter 18. Isaiah chapter 60 says, the light of the glory of God rises upon us, and the glory of God is seen upon us, and the wicked and the kings of the earth 
come to us, come to the, those of us who bear the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. So what is this, this rock that strikes the image at the feet, my friends? This is the beginning of the establishment of the eternal kingdom of God. It is the preaching of the everlasting gospel that brings down the nations of this world. Now, some have interpreted that rock to be the second coming of Christ. And I would say it is the culmination. It could be the culmination, but it's not the second coming because the second coming doesn't make the rock grow into a great mountain. The expansion of the rock into a mountain indicates the expansion of the kingdom of the most high. I hope you got that. The expansion of the rock into a mountain indicates that the gospel is being preached and declared and demonstrated to a world that does not know God. That's why the light is upon us and the Gentiles and the kings of the earth find their way to righteousness by those of us who have held on to righteousness. In fact, without getting complicated, I would like you to turn back to Isaiah chapter 11. And again, sometimes... You know, the way I study, I, I kind of do deep dive, you know, like I, I, I kind of go snorkeling. And sometimes as I'm snorkeling, people don't snorkel with me. And then, you know, you got to come up for air, which is fine. But when we're looking at the scripture, sometimes the deeper we dig, the stronger we can set our anchor. So when the temptations of life come our way, we're not easily swayed. The temptations will just knock us off. We have to dig deep. It's not enough. Listen to me, and I'm saying this respectfully. It's not enough to say, I love Jesus. It's just not. I'm sorry. Judas said the same thing. What has to happen is our love for Jesus must be anchored in the word of God. And our lives must be anchored in the word of God, not a mere profession of lips, but a demonstration in heart that the glory of God, the character of God can be seen by all men in this world. And my friends, the honest, the honest truth is we don't reflect them like we should. That's the honest truth. And I think more, more, more about Jesus. I want to know because it's him that's setting up this eternal kingdom. It's him that has these eternal principles that would allow for the everlasting gospel and an everlasting kingdom to be established without him. Nothing matters. Nothing matters. Let's go a little bit further. I'm going to do this for 12 more minutes. And then no matter where I am, I just got to stop. So back to uh, Isaiah chapter 11. I want to share a, a, a little bit more detail here with you. Watch this. Watch this. It says something very, very interesting in Isaiah 11. After it talks about the knowledge of God filling the whole earth. It says in verse 10. And in that day, there shall be a root of Jesse. Now, who's the root of Jesse? That's Jesus, okay? We shall stand for an ensign. So the root of Jesse is Jesus Christ. He's going to stand as an ensign or as a sign, watch, for the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. Come on now. <laughs> so the Gentiles are going to seek a sign, but that sign is the person of Christ, and when they find Christ, they find rest. Come on now. And that rest will be glorious. Verse 11. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left. Now it's going to list all the places where God's people have been scattered. Okay. From Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam, and from Shinar, and from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. And he shall set up an ensign. What do you mean? He's going to set up a sign for the nations, and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel, and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Pause. Wait a minute. Think. So the sign that's set up is Jesus. When they come to Jesus, they'll find rest. Then it says again, they're going to gather the people from all over the world and they're going to come to a sign. My friends, there's a banner. And that banner, I'm going to tell you right now, those of you who are listening, I'm going to prove it at another study. But right now, that sign is none other than the seventh day Sabbath. 
That seventh day Sabbath is a sign of loyalty to the most high God and not to the dictums and the whims of men. It is a sign. Ezekiel 20, verse 12, you can go look it up. Ezekiel 20, verse 20, go look it up. Exodus chapter 31, verse 17 and 18, go look it up. Exodus 20, verse 8 through 11, go look it up. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 12 through 15, go look it up. Luke chapter 4, verse 16, go look it up. Mark chapter 2, verse 27 and 28, go look it up. Acts 17, verse 2, go look it up. Acts chapter 18, verse 4, go look them up. All throughout scripture, Isaiah chapter 66, verse 23 and 24, in heaven, Sabbath will be kept. Look them up. All these texts indicate that these are the Sabbath is a sign. It is a symbol of sanctification. It is a sign between us and God that we are his and he is ours. But that sign without Jesus doesn't matter, right? So those who find Christ will find rest and they will hold the Sabbath as a sign. And all the world will come under that banner. The whole world under that banner. But watch, there's more. There's more. So they're going to be gathered. And there's interesting language here, and I don't want to labor because my time is running out. But if you read through here, particularly verse 15 and 16, it says, And the Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea. And with his mighty, mighty wind shall he shake his hand over the river and shall smite it in the seven streams and make men go over dry shot. Sounds just like when he delivered them out of, out of Egypt, right? And there shall be a highway. For the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, Assyria is a northern power, like as it was to Israel in that day that he came up out of the land of Egypt. So here you have a prophecy indicating that there's going to be a drying up of a water, which would allow for God's people to have a way of escape. Go with me to Revelation chapter 16 again. Revelation 16. Watch this. Watch this imagery. Revelation chapter 16. Beginning at verse number 12, the Bible says, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, interesting, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. The waters are dried up from Babylon. Why? So the kings of the east can come and take Babylon out, just like Cyrus took out Babylon, so Christ our most high will come as if it were from the east and the waters will dry up for God's people to be delivered. Let's go a little bit further. We're almost done. Isaiah chapter 66. Isaiah chapter 66. Isaiah 66. And we're looking at verse number 19 actually verse start verse 15 watch this isaiah 66 beginning at verse 17 isaiah 66 beginning at verse 17 they that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens behind one tree in the midst eating swine's flesh and abominations in the mouse shall be consumed together say of the lord now for a moment my friends we, are, we should know that we should not be eating mice, bats, or anything else. Those unclean things bring disease and disaster upon God's people and upon the world, just like it's bringing disease and disaster right now. For I know their works, this is the key point, for I know their works and their thoughts. It shall come that I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my, what's it say? See my glory. And I will set a sign among them. You see that? Same as we read in Isaiah chapter 11. And I will set a sign among them. And I will send those that escape of them. So those that, that escape, that come to the sign. I will send them to Tarshish, to Pool, and to Lud, that draw the bow, to Tubal, and to Javan, to the Isles of the Sea, uh, to the Isles of Aroth, I'm sorry, that they that have not heard my fame, neither have seen my glory, and they shall declare, declare my glory where? Among the Gentiles. So wait, wait for a moment, think. So there's going to be a sign. There's some that are going to come to this sign. When they come to the sign, they're going to be sent, and they're going to be sent back out to the world. 
when they're sent back out to the world, they're going to be preaching and teaching and gathering others back to the sign. So those of us who know the truth, that's what we should be doing. We should be going out to gather, to gather people to the sign, the, the person of Jesus Christ, the rest that we have found in him. That rest, my friends, is glorious. And if we have not found that sign, and I say the sign, and, and again, when I say that, my friends, I'm not talking about the theory of Christ. I'm talking about the experience of Christ. I'm talking about truly, truly finding peace with God and knowing you have peace with him, that you've been forgiven for your sins, that he stands as your intercessor in heaven, that you don't have to hold on to the things in your life that have held you down, that you have freedom in Jesus today. That is those who come to the sign and find their rest and know what God does. He writes his law in their hearts and they have rest and now go out and share with others how to find that rest. So watch what happens. Watch what happens. It says, Oh, I lost. Oh, here it is. Watch what happens. Verse 19. And I will set a sign among them and I will send those that escape of them unto the nations of Tarshish and Pool and Lud that draw the bow to the Teb, I mean, the bow to Tubal and Javon to the isles of far off that have not heard my fame, neither have seen my glory. And they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles and they shall bring all your brethren for an offering unto the Lord out of all nations upon horses and in chariots and in litters and upon mules, upon swift beasts to my holy mountain, Jerusalem, say of the Lord, as the children of Israel bringeth an offering in a vessel in the house of the Lord. So pause. I want you to get this before I get off the line. What's happening? This is a visual. It's, it's a visual of a symbolic activity. What's happening? There are messengers that are sent out and they're gathering people from afar and they're bringing them into a close relationship with Jesus. And as they're brought into this communion, into the body of Christ, the kingdom of God grows. The glory of God expands into the world. That kingdom grows because those of us who have the knowledge of God are sharing it, not just verbally, my friends. See, this is the easy part. Like I'm on this side of the screen. I can't see you. I can't see if you don't like me. I can't see if you hate me. I can't see that. But you can see me. But I can preach to you and then I can do what I do and you don't even know what I'm doing. So preaching is easy. It's the living part that's the problem. Are you feeling what I'm saying? Are you understanding? We give glory to God, my friends, by how we eat, how we sleep, how we talk, how we dress, how we treat our brothers, how we treat our sisters, how we treat the homeless on the street, how we treat those who we don't care so much about. The glory of God is demonstrated when God's people reflect him in their love for others. That's when the glory is seen around the world. Please don't tell me about how fancy your church is. Please don't tell me how loud your music is. Please don't tell me how great your preaching is. I care not. The world doesn't care. In fact, it's interesting, man. I put this stuff up for like to promote the Bible study and I see certain comments that people make and I'm cool with people uh, uh, saying certain things about religion and preaching and stuff like that. You know why? We've been hypocrites for so long. I can see why they don't trust us, man. I can see why they think every time we are trying to do something, we are trying to make a dollar. I can see it. I can understand it because we have misrepresented God this whole time. So in the last days, this rock cut out without hands strikes the image at the feet. The reason why this strike is impactful, my friends, is because God's kingdom is being established. His law, the foundation of his kingdom is being placed and all these other kingdoms come a tumbling down. The question is, does God's law reign in your heart today? The question is, is God's kingdom, the one that he... The one in heaven right now where he's negotiating, if you will, he's conversing with the heavenly father. He's saying, Father, I'm about to come get my children. They're not quite ready yet. However, here are the legal papers. I put in my blood on this account. I'm ready to take my children home. And he's my friends, he's doing that. And at the same time, he's doing that. He cannot have a kingdom if he does not have subjects. And the subjects must be subject to his law and his law. Is something that you and I can't do of ourselves. 
It's not natural for us to do. It is something that he alone has glory to do. He alone has the right to do. He alone is able to put it in our hearts. So stop trying to be a Christian and let him make you a Christian. Stop efforting to be a Christian and let him effort in you to be a Christian. Let this mind be in you. You see that? Just like let there be light. Let that word make itself manifest in your experience so that the righteousness of God can be seen in this world. God is desperate for it, my friend. So what is the counsel of his will? Ah, finishing there. The counsel of his will. Finishing here. I've said it, but I'll read it. Ephesians chapter one. It says, beginning at verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose, purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Well, what is his will? That we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So what's the will of God? Heaven and earth be combined in the person of his dear son. The will of God is that you and I have salvation in his son. There is no other way of salvation. There's no other means of salvation. There is another hope of salvation. Salvation is alone in Jesus. And if you don't have him, nothing else matters. You can get the best job in the world. It doesn't matter. Have all the grandkids you want to have. It doesn't matter. Jesus alone is the means of salvation. And Jesus alone deserves our praise and our worship. And Jesus alone deserves our loyalty. No church deserves our loyalty. No, no, no. No organization deserves our loyalty. No, no, no. The most high. Deserves our loyalty because he's died for us. He's given everything for us. Listen, I've been betrayed. I've betrayed others. I've been lied on, cheated about, left. left. <laughs> There's one constant. It's Jesus. One constant, my friends. Only one. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Prophecy is simply designed to have you trust him more than anything else in this world. The question is, will you do that? My friends, I've said my piece for the night. I saw a raised hand. I didn't see a. Let me see if I see a question. All right. I didn't see a question. My friends, we're going to be studying again tomorrow night. You don't want to miss that study. We're, we're, we're talking about developing Christian character, and tomorrow night we're going to be dealing with that very pragmatically. We're going through a book education. I want you to be there as we're growing together. For this, you know, as I'm teaching you, I, I'm always, the Lord always speaks to my own mind as we do this. So I just want to thank you guys for join, joining me this evening. Thank you for studying with me and taking time to study. Please, uh, if you are watching this and you want to, hear this again, you can join our podcast and our podcast usually has our messages up again. So this will be up probably in a couple of days and I'm recording these as well on video. So I'm going to be archiving these as well. So you'll see those available soon. I, I, I solicit your prayers. You know, these are tough times uh, for everyone, but if we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, there's nothing, no, no distress, no sorrow, no pain, that can separate us from the love of our Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So I encourage you, find your solace in Jesus. Spend time with him. Turn off the distractions and turn on your focus to the most high. God bless you this evening. And Maranatha, let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for not giving us what we deserve. Thank you for the revelation of your dear son. And I pray, Father, for each person that listens to this, that they will find themselves in your presence. 
more time with you. Please save us, Father. We are a broken people. We are sin-sick people, Father. Selfish. We pray, Father, to take our hearts where we cannot give them, for they are your property. Keep us for we cannot keep them ourselves. Save us from ourselves, our weak, unchristlike selves, and raise us into a pure and holy atmosphere where the rich currents of your love can truly flow through our souls. We pray this in Jesus' name and claim the merits of his blood. Amen. God bless. Of those of you who are in the webinar, you should be receiving the lesson tomorrow morning. Of those of you who are listening or watching on YouTube or Facebook, I'm sorry, and want to see this, or if you even get this on YouTube, because at one point it will be on YouTube at some point. If you want this, please email me, Facebook me, uh, inbox me privately. I will be happy to send you the lessons that we've already covered along with this one as well. God bless you. Good night.